Okay. Hey, welcome, folks. I'm glad you're all here. Um, welcome to the folks that are here in, in Spark. Thank you for coming out. Also to the people that are, are streaming uh, on YouTube and on Zoom. Uh, it, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Nina Olson, who is Executive Director of the Center for Taxpayer Rights, a global nonprofit that works to advance taxpayer rights in the United States and internationally. Among other initiatives, the, the center organizes and convenes the International Conference on Taxpayer Rights and operates a low-income taxpayer clinic support center, something that could support, for example, our VITA organization that, that we have the officers right here today. From March 2001 and 2009, to 2019, July of 2019, Nina served as the National Taxpayer Advocate of the United States, an independent organization within the IRS, with 1,600 or more employees across 79 offices in the US who are all dedicated to assisting taxpayers' problems in dealing with the IRS and making administrative and legislative recommendations to mitigate taxpayer problems in dealing with the IRS. Before serving as the National Taxpayer Advocate, Nina founded and directed the Community Tax Law Project, the first low-income taxpayer clinic in the United States. She also maintained the private legal practice assisting taxpayers in disputes with you with the IRS. Her full bio um, can be viewed on Wikipedia or even better at taxpayerrights.org. Um, you can read there online, you can listen to me, but you probably won't get the full power of what the, the force that, that Nina is. Uh, she brings and exerts to improve um, her energy. She exerts her energy to improve our tax system for the taxpayers who really don't have much of a voice. Please welcome Nina Olson. Thank you, Jeff. This was um, a really nice introduction and I'm so pleased to be virtually here with you. And I really apologize for not traveling, but I think you can all understand how we're just trying to do the best we can in this environment. Um, I do want to allow a lot of time for questions. And I know that this slide was up uh, for where you should text questions, but I'll just read it out one more time. 509-906. 4420 is where you should text. Um, and I want to apologize in advance. I have a Siamese cat who may decide to make an appearance occasionally, and you'll just have to, we just all have to live with that. Um, the topic today is taxpayer rights and taxpayer advocates and, and trust in the tax system. And I want to, you know, right now, I think the IRS is at a point, and for those of you who are accounting students, if you aren't practicing already, you know, you will be entering the tax world. You'll, some part of your practice will be involving tax. And it's important to note just what is happening in with the IRS and the tax system, and then how that is actually very dangerous to the overall health of our tax system. And I wanna go back to really some fundamentals that we don't really talk enough about um, these days. It's really easy to talk about whether you're for you know, high tax rates, progressive tax rates, flat tax rates, but we often forget about what taxes are for in the first place. And this past fall in October, and Jeff was there, um, we had a, one of our international conferences, which was actually scheduled for to be held in October 2020 um, in Pretoria, South Africa. And the theme of that conference was taxpayer rights, human rights, and um, issues for developing countries. And if you've ever done any research or any study into the developing countries, in particular the African countries, you will realize that with the very high unemployment rates that they have, individual taxation, they don't have a very broad tax base. Um, 
you know, and th through colonial powers and elsewhere, um, the, those countries have not been able to have the leverage to really be able to extract from the companies that are making a lot of money and profits from the minerals, et cetera, that those countries have. They haven't had the clout to be able to design their tax system to be able to raise the revenue that they need. And that brings me to my sort of first point, the revenue that they need. When you're working with developing countries, you can't help but realize why taxation exists. It is the way for the government, the state, to raise funds in order to meet the needs of its populace. And these are essentially basic needs to ensure that there's an infrastructure, enough of an infrastructure, so its populace can have education, can have basic education, can have basic housing, can have clean water, can have some kind of just system of justice. So if you have disputes, you can work those, there's some mechanism to work those things out. And we in a developed country take these things really for granted. And so we have the privilege to argue about rates, whether it should be flat or a progressive tax system, whether we should be taxing labor as more than we tax capital. But in other countries around the world, they don't have that luxury of talking about that. They're just trying to raise basic infrastructure money. And so we in developed countries get away from that concept of why tax exists in the first place. And I think that that's core to any understanding of taxation. If we don't understand why taxation exists, then we won't really be able to have a conversation about how that government should treat us when it is asking us to give for the public good. And as, although, you know, people talk about, well, it's a voluntary tax system. No, it isn't because the IRS has these awesome enforcement powers. It does have awesome enforcement powers. It has the ability to do things that any other creditor, um, you know, if we owe taxes, then we're debtors to the IRS or more precisely to the federal government, the public fisc. Um, you know, other creditors, if there's a debt that is not being paid, have to go to court to get the power to be able to levy on a bank account or garnish wages or file a lien. You have to have a judgment from a court in order to be able to file a lien as a creditor. Well, the IRS has those powers administratively. It doesn't have to ask a court whether it can levy or, or file a lien. It can go ahead and do that with some protections. But if we don't, you know, if we don't recognize the importance of the public fisc and what it actually does, then we won't be able to talk about the contract between the taxpayer and the government in the position of the IRS in a way that that avails ourselves of our rights and our protections, even as we're giving up property and goods and and our hard earned dollars um, or, you know, interest, whatever it is that we're giving up in order to meet the public good. And it's that dialogue, it's that contract between the agency and by extension, the federal government and the taxpayers that is actually at has been at risk for quite some time. And I would argue, you know, I watched that degradation over the 20 years that I was the national taxpayer advocate. So to me, um, I want to just start talking about, you know, well, what is that contract? So there are lots of, you know, there are lots of theories about what's the relationship between citizens and their government, but nothing is more personal than when the government is taking your money. So at the very least, and this is where I, I tried back in 2007 to embody in the Taxpayer Bill of Rights, this document that was first, you know, I first proposed in 2007, and then I proposed it again in, 2013, in 2011, I think, that Congress should adopt it. And then finally, in my annual report to Congress in 2013, um, 
you know, I recommended that the IRS just adopt the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. You didn't need to wait until Congress enacted it. That you would that you would actually have, you know, a statement, a general statement of what taxpayers have the right to expect in their dealings with the IRS or the tax system writ large. And, and they, the ideal was that they would be put in very basic terms and then taxpayers could understand them, but you could also use them as a teaching tool, both for IRS employees, but also as a way to analyze whether the IRS was actually respecting this bill of rights. Um, and so the IRS did adopt them in the summer of 2014, and the um, Congress did enact it into the Internal Revenue Code um, in 2015. And so what it actually says, and this is a part of the Internal Revenue Code that most people don't look at, but I spend my life in, are the procedural sections of the code, section 6000 and beyond, which is really all about rights and protections, and then you get into um, criminal tax provisions and things like that. But in 7803A, 7803 is the section of the Internal Revenue Code that dis basically describes the principal officers of the Internal Revenue Service. Um, 7803, or dealing with tax administration. 7803A is the commissioner's job description. 7803B is the Office of Chief Counsel's job description. 7803C was my job description as the National Taxpayer Advocate. 7803D is the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration, who is not an employee of the IRS, but is an employee of Treasury, and is the IG, the Inspector General, for looking at fraud, waste, and abuse in the IRS's administration of the tax system. 7803E and F, there's now a, the, uh, the, in, the Chief of Appeals of the Independent Office of Appeals, and then there is also the, a description of the Chief Information Officer, some of those duties. And th that section is actually very important because over time, Congress has become very active in describing what they expect of the IRS and in in these from these officers and so in 7803A3 congress said in 2015 that the commissioner shall ensure that his employees and it did say his his employees are um trained in at adhere to all of the rights in this title you know title 26 that taxpayers have and protections that Congress has, has enacted, including, and then it lists in the Internal Revenue Code, the 10 rights that I had recommended in 2007 and reiterated in 11 and 13. So, you know, a, there's been a lot of talk in a few court cases about whether that provision, for example, the right to quality service um, is enforceable. You know, is it something that you can sue under? And right now the courts have said no. But I would point out that at some point where you have a violation of the right to quality service, you could actually bring, I've been trying to think of a way to say the commissioner has failed in his job to ensure that IRS employees are adhering to this right. And therefore, you know, is there a cause of action against the IRS and commissioner? I don't know. But these are things that we can think about. And I think, as I said, the day after the codification, it will be a generation before we really understand fully what the meaning is of codifying the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. But at the very least, it serves as a framework for analysis. So let's look at the number one right is the right to be informed. And that goes to fundamental due process, you know, principles. Um, procedural due process under, you know, the case law that has developed from our constitutional issues 
the courts have said, the Supreme Court has said that at a minimum, it is due process is that the individual or the person could be a corporation, it could be an individual human, um, the person understands what is expected of them is given and is given notice of what is expected of them and then what they have not done. And then they are given an opportunity to be heard. And so it's both notice and an opportunity to be heard. And the right to be informed is that first component of that of due process, that if people don't know what is expected of them, then how can you hold them responsible for not doing what you are expecting them to do? That goes to clarity of notices, that goes to letters that are comprehensible, that tell people about what they should do and in order to comply with the laws, it means that you have to pick up the phone when taxpayers are calling with questions, when they want to make an appointment with you, when practitioners need to provide to receive information about their clients, they need to have they have the right to be informed. And as any practitioner that's listening here will tell you, right now, the IRS is not doing a good job with the right to be informed. The other thing is, in the right to be informed, taxpayers have the right to rely on information that the IRS has given them. You know, if the IRS is informing them something and then the next day says, oops, not so much, we're changing it, even though you filed your return based on what we said yesterday, now we've changed it, forget about it, you've made a mistake, we're assessing penalties and all sorts of things against you. That violates fundamental fairness. And so there are protections in the law that, that say that in certain ways and on in regulations that if you've relied on it, you know, then we won't assess penalties for you because it's reasonable cause. And in some instances, you can rely on IRS guidance, at least in your instance, to move forward. But that brings up, you know, some of what we're seeing in this in these times is the, that the that although you may be able to rely on treasury regulations and perhaps if you get a private letter ruling um, with an FAQ, a frequently asked question, you may not be able to rely on that if you're in an audit. The IRS in an audit may say, well, forget about what the fat the FAQ says. Under your case, we're holding differently. And so that has brought about that brought about a lot of of angst on the part of practitioners and taxpayers that you're going on a website and you, you're reading information, but you may not be able to rely on that information. And so how are you supposed to file? And that brought about that the pressure from taxpayers and also a lawsuit that came up in the economic impact payment context, which found the IRS's FAQ to be arbitrary and capricious and a violation of the Administrative Procedure Act because it was clearly in contradiction of the law, that that brought the IRS about to say that they were going to, for some FAQs, say that taxpayers could rely on them going forward. And um, at least if they followed the FAQ, they would not get a penalty um, if they followed the FAQ. So you can see how the right to be informed has all sorts of implications. And if you start from that analysis of, well, what's the purpose of the right to be informed? It's that notice component of fundamental procedural due process. Then you really start analyzing other aspects of, of people getting information from the IRS. So then we go to the right to quality service. And I want to spend some time on this because right now that right is being violated left and right. Um, it's just, you know, disastrous. Um, the IRS last year answered 11% of the phone calls that came in. It had record phone volumes because of it getting so far behind on returns. 
Um, and I, I just want to note that a lot of this is due to COVID, but the problems that the IRS has been experiencing are two decades, at least, as I said, in the making at the outset. And at some point, COVID is no longer going to become an excuse. And to me, what COVID did was it basically was the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, um, on the IRS's inability to provide to taxpayers the ser and practitioners the service and assistance that they needed, and the volume of calls and the inability to timely process returns just really exacerbated this situation that had been kind of miserable and lying, but still lying below the radar screen, like everybody could sort of limp along being miserable until it reached this enormous crisis point. And this filing season promises to be the worst filing season that we've seen in the history of the IRS. It will probably rival the one in 1985 when the IRS was, was moving over to um, uh, data processing and um, people got so far behind in processing returns that they hid bags of returns in closets and in trash cans and behind garbage cans and things like that in offices because they couldn't process them. Um, I was practicing at the time and got letters from the IRS saying, we know your client filed a return, but could you please give us a copy of it? Um, and that was always the low watermark for the IRS in modern times, um, but we're going to be living through the low watermark this year. What it has really pointed out is, you know, again, the archaic processes of the IRS systems, but also um, the lack of funding of taxpayer service. And in IRS land and speak and in appropriation speak, Processing returns is considered a taxpayer service. Um, not maybe not all of us would think that was a service, but then 80% of individual taxpayers get a refund. So, you know, they want their returns processed so that they can get their refund. Corporations want their refunds of, you know, their expedited refunds when they've overpaid and, um, you know, net operating loss refunds as well. And so processing is key to maintaining the faith with taxpayers. And we really, you know, with this filing season, we're going to see that faith tested in a way that it might actually break if something, if we don't show that the government is doing everything it can to, um, to catch up. And I predict that it will be nine months before the IRS is caught up with both 2020 returns and 2021 returns. If I, It may very well be that they won't be caught up until the end of the year of this calendar year. So why, why is that? Well, we all know about the archaic, you know, IRS information processing systems. What we don't really understand is how much work the IRS does manually. And so I'll just give you some data that was published both in the National Taxpayer Advocates Annual Report this past year, um, but also um, in some hearings coming up in the Treasury Inspector General as well. So normally the IRS gets some returns that get stopped in the process and they have to go to a place called error resolution to be worked on. Um, unfortunately, you know, in a normal year, it's about 706, the error resolution issues 760,000 math error notices. Well, what are math error notices? Math error notices are things that if, if, if they, they could be something as simple as two plus two equals five. And the IRS has the legislative authority to just correct your return. You don't get any rights. It's like you don't get to get a letter that says, we think two plus two equals four. If you have proof that two plus two equals five, please send us that information. We'll take a look at it and then we'll make a determination. We'll issue you what's called a notice of deficiency, which gives you the right to go to tax court, um, which is the only forum that you get to go to to, pay, to challenge the tax in court without paying the tax first, which is another fundamental taxpayer right, the right to appeal an IRS decision to an independent forum. So 
so normally the IRS issues about 768,000 math error notices a year. That's what it did in the 2020 filing season. Well, the 2021 filing season, we had the economic impact payments that were showing up during 2020 that needed to be reconciled on the tax returns. And, you know, with a rebate recovery credit, which, you know, you might get more, you might have gotten too much, but the IRS isn't going to collect that, but you still had to do the reconciliation. And the IRS sent a letter out to people telling them how much they got, but people got confused. They'd lose, you know, they lose letters, they've moved, the letter doesn't follow them, whatever. Well, this year, the IR in, in 2021, the IRS issued 13 million math error notices. So think about that. 760,000 some odd the year before, 13 million for last year, 2021. And of those 13 million, 11 million were dealing with the economic impact payments and the rebate recovery credits that people had gotten it wrong. And that constituted a math error. They didn't report their economic impact payment correctly, or you know they didn't report all of them, or maybe the IRS data was wrong. But all of those returns had to be looked at by a human being. Now, if the IRS were a top-notch financial processing agency, it would have thought about what could be possible errors happening to taxpayers and put a team on programming how you could automate, you know, the correction of these returns that, you know, the IRS knows how much it thinks you've gotten. The IRS can see what you claimed as re additional rebate recovery credit and EIP on the return, and it could automate the correction and spew out that notice as a math error without a human, a human being having to look at it and enter stuff into the system and things like that. But the IRS stretched thin, did not do that programming. And it's not clear to me whether it's because it's very, very hard to do it with the old systems that the IRS has, or that they just didn't have the resources, or that they just thought, well, we've sent out this letter, and so people have the letter, and they will be able to enter it um, correctly. And as someone who's an observer, a longtime observer of human behavior, it's like, relying on people to enter that correctly when all you've done is sent them a letter, particularly in the midst of COVID when so many people have moved around and given up their homes and moved in with family or, you know, are in the hospital or caring for other people, that, that this is just not, not a reasonable expectation and resources should have been put to process those, the 11 million EIP RRC um, math error notices and, and what's interesting to show the delay is that in July of 2021, the IRS had issued 7 million math error notices, of which 5 million were relating to the economic impact payment. So between July and the end of December, you know, the IRS had issued another 4 million. That's how long it was taking to get through these returns that were filed by April and were still being held because they didn't have enough human beings to look at this and because it wasn't automated. And that, that crisis, when you have people whose whole refund is being held up by that one little thing. It's not like the IRS said, well, we'll issue your withholding refund to you while we try to figure this out. No, it was the whole refund. So it could have been a refund that was significant, um, including earned income credit refunds, which are over $6,000. Those would have been held up because of the adjustment to the EIP. And it's one thing after another, after another in that processing, because the investment in the personnel, having enough bodies to do this kind of work, and the investment in the IT and modernizing the system, and thinking about these things proactively, 
um, have, has not been enough to get the IRS to a level that taxpayers expect and would have the right to expect. So that goes to your opportunity to be heard. One of your rights and the second half of the due process equation, you know, notice and opportunity to be heard. The second half of that is the opportunity to be heard. And in fact, we wrote into the Taxpayer Bill of Rights that taxpayers have the right to challenge an IRS decision and be heard. And so, you know, I put that in because of the Supreme Court procedural due process, you know, case law. Well, okay, you get to challenge the IRS's decision. Well, you know, you get a math error notice. You write in saying, or you try to call in at 11, math error notices give you 60 days to disagree with the IRS's position. And if you disagree with the IRS's position in that math error notice, even though the tax has already been assessed, it's math error. They don't have to give you any kinds of rights. They, they assess it first, and then you have 60 days to come in and say, I don't agree with this. And then they have to go through their normal procedures. So in your normal procedures, the IRS sends out a notice saying, well, let's just use an example. You know, we, you, we disagree with how much our records show you got much more economic impact payment than you reported on your return. You know that you never got that economic impact payment and you can show it by your bank account. You know, it didn't ever make it. Something went wrong. Well, you want to go into the IRS and disagree and maybe it's a lot of money, you know? So you try to call the IRS. It's 11% of the calls get through. You're not one of the lucky ones when you keep trying to call. So then you write into the IRS. Well, the same people who answer the phones also process the mail. And so if they're trying to answer these, this historic volume, over 200 million calls last year came in. More, that's twice as much as the normal year of calls, that the num number of calls that come into the IRS. You know, if, if you write it in, your mail may go against what we called shelved, against the wall. The IRS knows it's been received, but they haven't associated it with any case anywhere. They haven't figured out that you're saying, I disagree. And so that mail sits there for over 90 days. So that's over 60 days. The IRS doesn't know that you disagreed with them and that you have now they have to unassess, abate that tax, that, that adjustment that they made to you and give you, give you an opportunity to show, to prove to them, actually do an audit, you know, that you are able to come in and show that they are wrong. And if the IRS still disagrees with you, then they have to send you a notice of deficiency, which gives you the right to go to tax court before you have to pay this proposed assessment. And in the notice of deficiency, it's a proposed assessment. It's not the actual assessment. So you, you can live to fight another day in tax court. Well, what happens and has happened to millions of taxpayers this past filing season when they wrote in and said, I disagree, is that that letter sat there and the IRS, the 60 days goes by and the IRS says, well, okay, you didn't disagree. So now your case is going to collection. So all of a sudden, even though under the law, you should have the right to show the IRS how it's wrong and the IRS is required to abate that tax that they assessed, the IRS is actually collecting the tax against you. So you're fighting now on two fronts. You're trying to figure out where your letter is, where you have asked for deficiency procedures. And at the same time, you are fighting about this is unlawful collection because this tax by law needs to be abated. You cannot assess this tax. I have come in within 60 days and asked. And we are beginning to see some cases in tax court even where taxpayers are coming in, filing a petition anyway in tax court and saying the IRS is unlawfully 
you know, has unlawfully failed to abate the tax and, and, I, and is out actually collecting the tax. So you can see that this is also creating not just more work for the IRS, but incredible burden for the taxpayers. And the downstream consequences of this situation is to constantly erode trust. And that's where we get to, well, what's the role of the taxpayer advocate in this? Well, you know, the taxpayer advocate is supposed to be the voice of the taxpayer inside the IRS. And what we see with the taxpayer advocate for all of last year, when returns were being unprocessed, where amended returns were being not processed because amended returns have to be looked at manually too, where, you know, um, refunds weren't being issued, where people didn't know where their returns were. And this is not just paper returns. It's electronically filed returns that triggered some filter, whether it's identity theft or refund fraud, or like I say, math error. They're not in the IRS's systems enough so that you can tell exactly where they are. And so taxpayers don't know what's going on with the return. And the Taxpayer Advocate Service declared pretty very early in the year that they were not going to be able to help people on any return processing issues because they said there was nothing that they could do. If the return was sitting somewhere on the wall, there was nothing that they could do. Now, I can tell you that in the past, when the IRS has said to me when I was national taxpayer advocate, we don't have procedures for this or we can't do anything, we're so backlogged, that what we did in the taxpayer advocate service was that we took those cases in, we told the taxpayer that these were basically test cases. We were using them to force the IRS to come up with better procedures. And we issued what was called taxpayer assistance orders in bulk. We, we would you know, hold the cases and then once a week, we would send all the cases on this particular issue from all of my offices around the United States. We had 79 offices and we would send a taxpayer assistance order over to the IRS saying, you will process these things within X amount of days, or this will be elevated up the chain all the way up to the commissioner. And that would force them to figure out a way to work the cases that we had in order to deal with this. Now, unfortunately, um, TAS has been swamped. It was during COVID one of the few functions that were delivering taxpayer service that, that actually was staffed for telework. And so the, the, the employees of the Taxpayer Advocate Service were overwhelmed. And so I think the Taxpayer Advocate Service made the decision that they just couldn't take these cases in. But what it left was taxpayers floundering. And the safety net that they were really looking toward just was absolutely not available to them. And so then what happened was that the congressional, the taxpayers started going to congressional offices and congressional offices have been absolutely flooded. And now what you start seeing are, you know, members of Congress, 109 members of Congress and 42 senators writing letters to the IRS about what are you doing about processing returns? And you know, what is happening now and why are you doing this and what are, why aren't you doing that? And what about penalty relief? How can you penalize people when you can't process returns? So all of this is creating an environment where there is such distrust and frustration with the IRS that it's very hard to make the case for it to get the additional funding that it needs. And it's also saying to taxpayers that that you know, it's sending them, taxpayers are taking the message like when you come out to me, IRS, and say, you know, we need you to do X within 15 days. They're like, well, you took you know nine months to process my return. Why would I respond to you? Which is not a smart response because the IRS has these awesome enforcement powers, but it does um, it does really jeopardize that relationship. And so to close before I open it up for questions, um, the way I think about this is I've, there's a, there's a um, 
an economic psychologist, um, Eric Kirkler, who I've worked with a lot over the years. And he proposed a theory about the balance between um, it, it, power and trust in the tax system. And his theory sort of goes like this, that, you know, trust, there's got to be a balance of power and trust, you know, the, the, the use of power in enforcing the laws, there is legitimate use of power. And it the legitimate use of power actually builds taxpayer trust. If you're using power to ensure that people who owe taxes and are trying to evade taxes um, are not getting away with it, then that makes the taxpayers who are paying their taxes feel more trust that the tax system is fair. They're not being chumps in the tax system. On the other hand, if the government uses coercive power, it comes down on someone with a sledgehammer that erodes trust. It's a disproportionate use of power and it erodes that trust. At the same time, if you provide service and you build up trust by listening to taxpayers and, and providing them the services that they need and the assistance that they need and the information that they need and you protect their rights, then you are also building trust. But if you don't provide that service, then your trust is eroded. And that balance where, you know, right now, if you take the example of someone who has, you know, made a mistake maybe with their economic impact payment, has gotten a notice from the IRS and they say, well, I disagree and I'm following what you told me, what you informed me to do. Write in, you know, challenge this within 60 days and we will abate it and give you more rights, the right to present information and be heard. And then the right to go to an independent forum, the tax court. And suddenly that is not, is not being given to you, even though you've done the right thing, and at the same time, coercive power in the form of collection letters is coming out to you, you can see the dynamic of trust being constantly eroded. And that is where we are today. And now I'll take questions. <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah. So you you see the the tax number up there, and you might just jot it down. Even even if you don't, uh, let me unmute. Oh, so Nina, Nina can hear me. Can Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm going to take. Now I'm getting feedback. I don't know how to do this. Any anyway, um, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, make this text number available. And even if you don't have a question right now, write it down and, uh, if you have a, a, a piece of paper because I'm going to um, remove it in just a second because I have to, I have to stop sharing the screen. I only have a small uh, notebook computer here. Anyway, um, with that in mind, let's see if the first question is, how should the IRS <laughs> reach out to homeless people to make sure they get their stimulus checks? Right. So, you know, I was just reading a report today about the massive efforts that the nonprofit sector and state governments have done to reach out to people to get them their economic impact payments and also to get them the advanced child tax credit and now get people to file for the second half of the child tax credit, which is significant money. Um, and what the IRS has done is it has created a list of uh, homeless shelters or homeless, what they would call trusted partners, um, and is allowing people to use the address of shelters to, um, to, to that, that shelters can use their address to have checks if the person is unbanked um, be delivered there. But it is challenging. And I think that, you know, this is where, again, it goes back to my trust is the IRS, the person, the entity that should be reaching out to these homeless people who often are, you know, 
have no, no need to communicate with the IRS. And it's in that place that, that the, the public sector, the nonprofit sector really is important. Um, and I think, you know, to me, there are lots of groups that are trying to get this information out there. There are lots of websites, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities have a whole bunch of, um, of uh, materials to, you know, postcards, things like that, but that flyers that could be put out at homeless shelters so that people, when they go there to check in, can, um, or at food banks or in feeding programs, just print off a whole ream of stuff so that people can go and get their returns filed, whether it's at VITA or somehow maybe at the shelter, they can use some of the apps like Get CTC or Get Your Refund. Um, unfortunately, this year we don't have a simplified filing portal like we did have the last few years for people to get that simple thing. But I think, again, this is where there has to be a partnership between the IRS and the nonprofit sector. And the IRS, other than VITA, has really not been integrated with the nonprofit center that, um, you know, the, the nonprofit component, the, the organizations that serve the most vulnerable populations. I will say this, this is the other thing, and then we'll, we can take another question. You know, this also reflects something that I have been after the IRS since, oh, I don't know, 2002 or so, which is that the IRS has failed to acknowledge that it has a dual mission. It is no longer about collecting revenue. It is a major disperser of social benefits. It is a social benefits administrator. The earned income credit is the largest anti-poverty federal, federal anti-poverty program for families that the federal government runs. And the, the EITC and the child tax credit this year outstrip every other anti-poverty program in the United States in terms of getting money out to children. So when you look at that, if you don't recognize that the IRS, you know, then you add on the Affordable Care Act and the premium tax credit and the advanced premium tax credit, which is getting helping families get be able to afford health insurance and get the health care that they need. When you look at all of those things that are done on a daily basis with the IRS, if the IRS doesn't recognize that it has two missions, two jobs to do, and then organize itself accordingly so that there should be a whole outreach branch that is interfacing with these social welfare groups and advocacy groups and community service providers that maybe have no connection with tax, but now because they're really trying to get people to get their economic impact payments and their EITC and their child tax credit. It needs to really pivot and create a whole branch of employees that are working on that and that alone as part of its job as social benefits administer, administrator, even as it's doing its traditional mission of collecting revenue. And its failure to do that, recognize that back from 2001 on, sort of finds us in this place here. There's no infrastructure to really deal with these populations. Can you still hear me all right, yep. Nina? Um, the next question is, if you had a magic wand, what is the first thing you would do to help the IRS build trust back? Yeah, oh, dear. Well, you know, I wrote a, a, an op-ed, a commentary in the Washington Post about 10 days ago. It was published in the paper last Sunday, um, Sunday a week ago. And it was really about five things the IRS needed to do just to fix this filing season. But if I had a magic wand, I mean, everybody talks about funding and it does need more funding. There's no doubt about it. It needs more funding for enforcement. It certainly needs more funding for service and it needs to have more funding for its IT. But I think what I would do is two things. One, I would revise its mission statement just as I described it, which is to recognize 
that it has dual mission. And the reason why I say that for those of you who are studying management, you will know that mission statements drive, you know, strategic plans that drive, you know, your goals and your strategies and your initiatives, and it drives the skills of the employees that you're hiring. And also it drives the performance measures that you have. You know, if you have a social benefits mission like social security, part of what you're measuring is that the eligible taxpayers are getting the percentage of eligible taxpayers who are actually getting these benefits, not so much, you know, how many people you're nabbing having made a mistake. Um, and that changes your performance measures. So that's one thing that I would do. But the second thing I would do is create an office of transformation. And I would hire someone from outside who had been experienced in transforming technology and, and organizational culture and make them the chief modernization or tra chief transformation officer. And I would hire people from outside and keep that office completely um, separated from the rest of the IRS in the sense that they couldn't be siphoned off for other jobs. Like, you know, Congress passes some law and, oh, we need these tech people to come over here and help us. Nope, they're not going to do that. Because every time the IRS has tried to transform itself and do something like that, the people that it hires then get siphoned off and then you never get anywhere. And so that's the other thing that I would do. I would really just create a separate office that is charged with dealing with this transformation of the agency into the middle 21st century? Okay. Um, thinking of Forbes' suggestion, this is a few years back, to have a tax return that fits on a postcard, could IRS performance be much improved with simplification of the tax code? Well, you and know, that's a... Yeah. And if yes, what are the chances of a simplification of the code? Well, none, but there's that. Um, but yes, it would be it would be much easier for the IRS to administer a simpler system, but one person's simpler system is another person's less fair system, right? There's, you know, part of the reason why we have the complexity in the code is because you're trying to address either specific enforcement concerns like somebody's getting away with something that you don't want them to or that you're actually trying to recognize people's circumstances and i will just have to say that all of those tax systems around the world that have pre-population and you just hit a button are usually based with the taxpayer being an individual they do not tax the family unit as the taxable unit the minute you add family structure into a tax code, whether it's married filing jointly or it's married filing jointly or families with children, you create so much complexity because unless you have a state that totally tracks where people are and who's in what family, the agency does not know that. And that means that it just brings so much more complication. And so unlike many countries around the world, we run all of these family provisions through the code. And so just on an individual level, um, just you know, think about what you've been studying about the tax code, education credits, you know, um, child and dependent care credits, uh, child tax credit, earned income credit. In many other countries, those are direct outlays. They're not run through the tax system. What the tax system does is look at wages, self-employment income, investment income, capital gains, whatever. And that's what goes into the system. And it's done on an individual. Um, we don't have that system. Yeah, that, um, this is a, a, a thoughtful question. I, I, I find it interesting. It says, you mentioned building trust between the taxpayers and the IRS. Many seem to hate the IRS because of the issues you've discussed. What do you believe are steps that we as taxpayers can take to help build up that trust on our end? Uh, just contact our representatives and tell them we want more funding for the IRS. Are there other avenues? 
Well, I think that that's a really good question. And I think that is one way. I mean, I think that, you know, right now, you know, certain people are going to use the IRS's poor performance, you know, to justify not funding the IRS, which just guarantees continued poor performance and erosion of trust. So I think speaking up about the need for a modernized, robust IRS and additional funding for taxpayer service and transforming the IT system so that you can get what you expect from the IRS and deserve from the IRS is really important. Secondly, I, I'm a big believer in just having conversations one-on-one. -on -one. And that's why I started this conversation with, well, what are taxes about? And I think if you find yourself in a conversation with some, probably not a Facebook post or something, you know, you don't need to get in a snit like that. But, you know, if you're having a conversation one on one with somebody and they're, you know, dumping on, you know, they're equating everything, you know, that the IRS is evil and this and that. And the, well, the IRS didn't want didn't write the tax laws. The IRS has very little control over its budget, you know. Um, and so being able to talk to someone about what taxes are for even if you don't think that certain things should be run through the tax code or that government funding shouldn't be used to fund this thing or that thing, there is always something that people think the federal government should do. And that is what taxes are for. And it's even as fundamental as clean water. Talk to the people in Flint, Michigan, right? You know, talk to the people in, you know, that are suffering from disasters and wildfires and floods. You know, these are the things that you need to have a federal government or government about. And government gets its money because it doesn't own industries like in socialism. You know, government gets its money from taxpayers and maybe talk about that. And don't just let people, you know, just say high level, you know, I hate the IRS. Well, let's talk about where the IRS is and why we actually should want more funding of the IRS so we get the kind of treatment that we deserve. Um, I, and this is kind of related uh, and it's probably gonna be our last one as I, I, I'm, we're nearing the end of our session. What caused such a staffing shortage at the IRS? Well, you know, it was a that's a really good question. And that's why I say this has been going on for 20 years. You know, I had the privilege of being in the senior leadership of the IRS for 18 years. And so I saw 18 budgets being created. And if you don't know the, the just briefly, the budget cycle is, you know, the IRS is starting right now on fiscal year 2024 budget cycle and 2024 would start a year from this coming um, October 1st. And so the, the whole leader, you know, you get together and you say, well, what is it we think we need in order to do both the enforcement side of the house and the service side of the house? And then we all put together, like, here is our proposals and the commissioner and his really core leadership team, you know, think about it. And they hand up to treasury a proposed funding level for the IRS, which you know includes staffing for everything, IT modernization, et cetera, and new initiatives based on what they think might be happening in the world of tax that they might need to pay attention to. And then Treasury looks at it and it sends it back and it always is a haircut. You know, nope, not going to give you what you think you need. And, you're, and gives you directions, like this is how you have to fix it. And sometimes, it's, some years it's been, you've got to cut 5% from everybody. And when you've got 2% inflation, and then you're cutting 5%, and, and you know, wait, and wages are going up, you know, the salaries are going up on a baseline, and yet you're cutting, and 96% of your budget is labor, you know, this is what happens year in and year out. And after Treasury gets done with it, it goes to the Office of Management and Budget. And the Office of Management and Budget often comes back and says, always comes back and says, cut. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it's a flat cut against every program. Sometimes it's cut this. And so what finally gets to the president's budget, which goes over to Congress, has nothing to do 
with what the IRS leadership itself thought were its needs. And I can just use my own former organization as an example. When I entered the Taxpayer Advocate Service in 2001, I had about 2,150 employees, 2,150 employees in about 76 offices, 75 offices around the United States. Okay. When I left in 2019, I had 1,600 employees. Okay. So I lost about 600 employees over those years. And that was solely the effect. They didn't cut the Taxpayer Advocate Service budget, but inflation over 20 years meant that those wages were going up on the government scale. You know, there's a pay raise every single year, except for two. And, and yet my budget stayed back level. And so that's where those 600 employees go. And that's the IRS writ large. Okay. Well, Nina, it, you, you did not fail to uh, inspire me anyway. And I hope, I hope you can all uh, agree that um, someone who takes a passion that she has and wants to dedicate it to improving our system. We, we need more people like that. We, we do have, and Junie, where, would you raise your hand? Where's, she's there. She's the vice president of, of VITA. And we are meeting with taxpayers on Saturday afternoons Great. Um, here at Neal Public Library. Uh, and we are quite open to having more, more people join our, our crowd. We, um, so, but anyway, thank you so much, Nina. Really appreciate it. Take well, care. Thank you for the invitation. Thank <laughs> you.